I'm not a guilty man. I'm an innocent man. I didn't come here to make trouble or to bring trouble, but to bring the truth. And God damn it, that's what I'm going to do. Nobody can call them weird, odd, urban gorillas, cultish. They aren't odd. They're little kids. And they were burned to death. No matter what anyone thinks about the adults, and what anyone says whether or not those adults contributed to the deaths of those children, the fact of the matter is that the deaths of those five children is inexcusable, intolerable, and should not have occurred in a civilized society. People then, there was still an is now uh, African American area neighborhood. You still have now retired doctors and teachers and principals who live in that area. It's always been a great area. People always thought it was a nice place to live. It was just ironic that Move decided to uh, go into that neighborhood and and uh, take over and make their move or make a stance as to who they were, what they believed, and uh, how they wanted to affect the neighborhood. And I think that's the thing that, that people feared, or the system feared the most. Many people can tell you that the system is wrong. But when you actually put it into action and actually do something about it and get other people to see that too and get them to do something about it. I mean, these people, these MOVE people, our original MOVE members, they, they were phenomenal, fantastic. What John Africa would say, one, one, one example is worth a thousand MOVE meetings. MOVE was founded in the early 1970s by this man, Vincent Leapart, a local handyman who renamed himself John Africa. Your brother Vincent Leapart was John Africa, is that correct? Um, my brother, Vincent Leapart, was my brother. John Africa was the founder of the MOVE organization. And they were one and the same? I said my brother was my brother. And I said John Africa was the founder of the MOVE organization. John Vincent Leapart is my brother. MOVE members wore their hair in dreadlocks and lived in communes. All members took the last name Africa. We believe that man's lifestyle is wrong and we're about getting rid of it. What MOVE wanted to get rid of was quite simply the evil establishment, including the government, which they said was alien to life itself. MOVE means light, the air, the sun, the rain. That's why they will never stop moving. They will never stop what's right. They can't stop what's right. You can't stop the air from blowing. You can't stop the sun from shining. That's why they never stop the MOVE organization. John Africa was teaching people one very simple thing, that life is the priority. There is nothing more important or more powerful than life. There are Catholics and Methodists, evangelists, theologians, you name it. We were the religion of life. Where is it written that we could not have a religion of our own? What John Africa did was expose the lie and the system, uncover it. Could you describe the, what you mean by the word the system, please? The system, the establishment, you. The word move is not an acronym. It means exactly what it says. Move. Work. Generate. Be active. Everything that's alive moves. If it didn't, it would be stagnant. Dead. Movement is the principle of life. And because move's belief is life, our name is move. When we greet each other, we'll say, on the move. A small vocal minority among us 
seeks to destroy the heritage of 1776. We must be ever vigilant that this minority does not impose its philosophy on the unwilling majority of Americans. Philadelphia has gained an international reputation as a city with one of the toughest police departments in the world. It's a force of 7,500 men, shaped over the past four years into a formidable urban army, run by one man without political interference. His name is Frank Rizzo. He is a policeman's cop, often called the super cop. He holds more than 60 awards and citations, and has been mentioned as a possible successor to J. Edgar Hoover. They was falsely arrested, right? They was falsely arrested. Mm. They send them, they had them in Holmberg Prison, Detention Center, House of Correction, Gratis for places like that all across the state, they, they, they locked them up for, for illegal charges and had them all in jail. The move people demanded, just like they demanded this time, that these people be released. And because of the community support, right, Rizzo and them saw that if the community kept supporting them the way they was, then they would be showed in the world how mad and crazy that they really were. You gonna mug me? I'm not gonna mug you. It's that gorgeous one, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veeley now. Now what I say, let's forget all the rules of this great country we live in. I will go back to that wall with the three of yous. Just me. There is a You're a here. crumb creep coward. You can't take, you don't, you won't stand up to him. I'm, sta I'm standing up. We're not here to fight. We're here to get some answers to some questions. Answers. That's all. I want to fight you. Why is that? Because you're a crumb creep, lush coward. You don't even know me, Mayor. You are a lush. I can tell by looking at you. I was a cop all my life, and I know a lush when I see one. And you're a lush. You're going to have a hell of a story on that one. <laughs> Play every word of it, crumb. The key issue was police brutality. It was a legitimate issue. So he can kill everybody in the South and justify it by using public opinion. For everybody out there to understand that we will not back down for wisdom. The move had a good cause, it had good things, good issues, and so forth, but the way they conducted themselves in the public arena was questionable. As a result of MOVE's demonstration strategy, MOVE members were arrested on a regular basis. Confrontation started with authority, and then it wound up that we was going to court, and then the confrontation started with the courts and the judges, and it just snowballed into, you know, uh, one confrontation after other against the system. You have to understand that the MOVE organization had challenged the authority and the jurisdiction of every courtroom that any MOVE member ever stepped in. And they challenged it, uh, you know, uh, vigorously and they challenged it from the outset so that the power of the court to hear their case, uh, whatever case there might have been, was always challenged by MOVE, that you don't have authority, you don't have the power to, to hear this case. Uh, when MOVE first surfaced as an above ground chapter, we would work with people in the community. We had a program where guys would come to us from the prisons and say, man, we need your expertise to help us get off drugs and, you know, and to live a, a hard working existence. They trusted us. If you look at what happened uh, to MOVE, both in 1978 and the shootout that they had with the Philadelphia Police Department, as well as in May of 1985, in both instances, the, the West Philadelphia community that they had um, lived in, it was their neighbors that were engaged in filing complaints to the police. 1981, MOVE relocated its headquarters to Osage Avenue in this middle-class neighborhood of West Philadelphia. There, MOVE's lifestyle soon began troubling their new neighbors. They walked around properly naked. They had their houses loaded with animals, all sorts of stray animals. The people looked like they had come out of caves. You know, the houses smell. They live in stench. They were saying all kinds of things about MOVE. They were saying things like we throw shit out of windows and we pee on each other and we, I mean, just, just anything to make people think of MOVE as just like subhuman. The first uh, contact with, with the police department grew out of move members in some kind of display of arms. No, no, no. See, so you even I'm just I'm trying I know you're lost. Listen, right? we were pushed into the criminal justice system. I think maybe about 150 arrests, maybe even more than that. Mm -hmm. For misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. I mean, and contempt of court. They just they, we were we were so en engulfed by the gym, the criminal justice system that we had they were giving us something like $50,000 bail for disorderly conduct. 
would be the buildup of these complaints and the tension within the community that would demand police intervention. Why do you think the city wants them out of here? What do you think the you know, re real reasons for why do you think Rizzo is coming down this hard when the, you know, Drexel, Drexel, money, profit, and aside from that, it's a personal vendetta. It's a personal vendetta. All right. All right. The, the area that, that move was in, what they call like Drexel, just like Temple University, they gobbling up all the land here, right? So they was taking all that land and they didn't want to move there. That's the main reason that Rizzo was attacking the move organization. Not only because he didn't like them, it's because the Drexel University was pushing it. You know what I mean? They was pushing that they wanted them out of the area, right? That strikes at the core of, the, of a value system. And so too often, because we want to preserve and maintain property values, because we want to preserve and maintain middle class values and, and even upper class values, the, those two things will run counter to the values that MOVE was engaged in. In other words, what does it mean to be a neighbor? What does it mean to engage in a community, right? And who is to dictate to the community what values are going to be promoted? And so for John Africa, um, embracing, for example, the environment, for embracing, for example, animal rights, embracing, for example, um, black liberation theology, as well as black power theology, um, these values ran counter to middle and upper class whites and middle and upper class blacks. So for me to be a property owner in this West uh, Philly neighborhood, um, you know, I need my property values to be maintained, if not go up. But if I have a move member or a move family next door, the perception is, oh, my property values are going down because they are engaging in loitering, litter, noise pollution, who would expect that at the top they would say, you know, you see four and bomb, a, bomb a your neighborhood, bomb a city. The whole sky's lit up. And uh, so, you know, in terms of rules, what do you say? You're not allowed to bomb your own city? I mean, you know, it's just unbelievable. If we let the roof burn to get the bunker, could we then subsequent to that control the fire i wanted to get the bunker i wanted to be able to somehow have tactical superiority without sacrificing any lives if it were at all possible We call it institutionalized racism, and that's exactly what it was. Because we were black and because the, 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 the institution has a way of handling black people. I hate you black bastards. You stink. I hate your black skin. I hate your black pants. I hate black pepper. Through the system, you understand, it didn't matter whether Wilson Good was black or whether Wilson Good was white. It's the institution. It's the governmental institution. This is the way we handle black people. As a mayor of the city, I accept full and total responsibility for decisions made to in fact go in and to evacuate the Osage Avenue house. I stand behind those persons who made those decisions. I support my commissioners. I support my managing director. And I want the people of the city to judge me by that Would decision. Would you call an educated Negro with a B.A. or an M.A. or a B.S. or a Ph.D.? I'll tell you, you call him a nigger. That's what the white man calls him, a nigger. See, you have to understand this type of thinking. And under to understand this type of man, you must understand that historically, there were two types of slaves, the house Negro and the field Negro. Now, the house Negro, he lived in the house next to his master, in the big house, either in the basement or up in the attic. He dressed pretty good. He ate pretty good. What the master left him. He loved his master. I say he loved his master better than the master loved himself. First of all, white man, let me say that I love you, honor you, envy you, enjoy your smell, and I celebrate you in the name of white Jesus. Uh, um, uh, and we kept calling back and saying, uh, what's going on? Why can't you put the fire out? And the man said, I'm looking at the television. The fire, that fire is getting hotter. 
I mean, it's getting larger. Put that fire out. And I said, I, ju I just finished talking to the commissioner, told him to put the fire out. According to one of the survivors, a child named Birdie Africa, move women and children were huddled under wet blankets in a basement garage while a police video crew took these pictures. Well, that's, that's basic counterinsurgency theory, is that it's not enough to focus on the guerrillas, or it's not enough to focus on the insurgents, that you need to find their base of support in the population and neutralize that. You said we know Rizzo want to see us dead, all right, but I'm saying, you know, only, only reason why he, why he want to do that is to stick his chest out. All right, we saying like, uh, right now, because there ain't no white members in here, he's going to try to take advantage of them. So that's the only reason why he's talking about coming in here. That's the only reason well, why you, Lindell is pushing this shoot because there ain't no white members in here. All right, they don't care about nobody black, man, you know that. Over the next hour, the fire moved down through the house and began to spread to adjacent homes. It wasn't until 90 minutes after the fire started that MOVE members tried to escape. At that time, witnesses heard gunshots coming from the back alley. Some shooting started. Could you hear shooting? Mm. What did it sound like? It was a... Like Police gunfire forced MOVE to stay in the house. That's when we started yelling at kids coming out and they... And then they opened the garage door. I know they heard us. I know they heard us. We were saying, we want to come out. And what did the other children do? Did they do the same thing? Yeah. Were any of the children crying? Yeah, we all were. I've been a revolutionary all my life. Since I could understand the word revolution, I have been a revolutionary. And I remain a revolutionary because, don't you see, revolutionary simply means to turn, to generate, to activate. It don't mean it should be evil and kill people and bomb people. Today, people tell us that the Sixers was not about revolution, but it was about the flower children in Hayden, Ashbury, and San Francisco making love and not war. They tell us it was about hippies. If they find themselves talking about African people in this country, what they suggest is that perhaps it has something to do with a generational thing, that a few young people were caught up by these mysterious times and got involved and the reality is that revolution was the main trend in the entire world in the 60s, not just in Philadelphia. But everywhere in the world, oppressed people had risen up and were fighting for their freedom. We are a part of that era. Even those of us who struggle for some kind of honest analysis or assessment of what that era was about, most of us don't understand what it's about. And I want to just say something about it because I think it has a lot to do with our situation today and how we understand the task before us right now. As a consequence of the Second Imperialist War, which is too often referred to as World War II, and uh, where people tell us that it was a war that was fought for democracy, but which in fact was an imperialist war where everybody engaged in the war was bandits. It was a war to redivide the world. It was a war where Germany, having felt as a consequence of the first imperialist war, which also was a war to redivide the world, having felt that it had lost most of its possessions, its colonial possessions, and even part of its territory through the Versailles Treaty, had struck out to dominate the world resulting in the United States leaving that war as the most powerful country in the world. We saw the world monetary system move from England where it had been previously to the United States. And we saw what had previously been colonies of Europe and Japan now becoming colonies or neo-colonies of the United States. We get fed a lot of fairy tales about the Second Imperialist War. There's something that African people uh, cannot tolerate. 
uh, because again, we get told that this war was something about democracy and fighting for democracy, but it was a war that occurred at a time where lynching was a national pastime in this country, lynching of African people. The reality is that the Nazis had nothing on the U.S. and certainly it had nothing on forces like England. We have come to understand in the world that the worst crime in the world has been committed against white people by other white people. What Hitler did that was the criminal act was he treated white people the way the white world were treating Africans and Indians and everybody else around the world and this was the thing that was an unpardonable act uh, by Hitler. I don't measure anything that's happening to African or other oppressed peoples around the world about some contest between white people about who was going to control the rest of the world. In the past what they would do is go to Eastern Europe to get workers and bring them here. In fact that's where the term hunky came from from the Hungarians, and it was white people fighting against other white people who were Hungarians who came up with the term hunky to describe those Hungarians and actually fought them in the streets over jobs. They needed workers, but they couldn't go to Eastern Europe to do it now because Eastern Europe had become part of what they referred to as the Soviet bloc. So in order to get the workers they need to transform the raw materials into finished products, they went down south. In this country, there were two means of capitalist production. In the North, capitalist production was capital intensive, which meant that it occurred in factories using machineries and what have you. In the South, capitalist production was labor intensive. Southern white capitalists were not going to willingly allow African people to leave. In fact, it was during a time where most of our parents and grandparents were sharecroppers in the South. You couldn't leave if you wanted to leave. If they caught you leaving often, they would put you in the chain gang and then rent you out to the same plantation that you were trying to get away from. That's the sound of the police. That's the sound of the beast. To understand slave patrols, it's important to understand the, the slow development of the state intervention in maintaining slave society, beginning with simply passing laws that would restrict the activities of the slaves, and then laws on their own being insufficient, authorizing any adult white man to enforce those laws, but then the reliance on individual action proving insufficient, forming into this body called the slave patrols that were a offshoot of the militia and worked as kind of a voluntary compulsory organization, meaning that participation was mandatory, but it wasn't a professional outfit. That was the kind of democracy that African people were experiencing in this country at that time. It was based on this that we saw the rise of the civil rights movement in this country. And the civil rights movement represented an alliance between the liberal sector of the white ruling class in this country and between the liberal sector of the African petty bourgeoisie or middle class. That's what the civil rights movement was. Because they assumed that they could integrate into the capitalist system if African masses had the right to vote. We were living in places throughout the South where often there were majority African communities where black people could not register, black people could not vote, Black people could not run for office and the only criteria for running uh, for office and being in power was that you be white. That kindling, let's talk about some of that kindling at Ferguson. Kindling. 67% of Ferguson's population is African American. The black voter turnout rate was 6%. How do you turn 67% of the population into 6% of the voters? Those are numbers from Jim Crow. Slaves historically have been of all races, but in the US, the institution of slavery created a chromocracy, a hierarchical order in which blackness was legally defined as servitude and whiteness as freedom. Over 245 years, the institution of slavery produced blackness as a race that was marked by dispossession and dehumanization. This is the basis for the fact that the civil rights movement uh, was based tactically on and strategically on philosophical nonviolence. Uh, no matter what happens, 
that we would always be nonviolent because the civil rights movement was funded by the liberal sector of the white ruling class. And they were not about to fund a movement that could actually overturn the entire system. They were not about to fund a movement where African people would actually pick up a gun and fight back. It was an absolute necessity that the leadership of that movement called for nonviolence under any circumstances, no matter what crimes, what atrocities committed against our people, our community, our children, our women, we would be nonviolent. Some people mystify that. They say the civil rights movement was based on nonviolence because uh, Martin Luther King was a Christian. And that's total and absolute nonsense. The reality is the Ku Klux Klan was also a Christian organization. And their Christianity told them to lynch and kill black people who wanted freedom. And King's Christianity told us to nonviolently be lynched and be killed in the process of having freedom. The reality is that it was a movement that was funded by a sector of the ruling class that did not want to see itself overturned, just wanted to see another sector of it moved out of the way so that capitalism could grow and flourish in this country. The people who constructed such an alliance as that made the assumption that the average uh, African masses of sharecroppers and what have you were simply malleable, backwards, ignorant folk who could simply be led any way that the ruling class and the black liberals wanted them to be led. But the truth of the matter is this, that the people, any people, once in the process of changing the world become changed themselves. And people who one day were simply uneducated sharecroppers who were out trying to change the world, they became transformed. And they stood up like people like Fannie Lou Hamer and people like Willie Ricks and others uh, sung and unsung heroes. And they made a tremendous movement and found and discovered their own interests. And their own interests were separate and distinct from the interests either of the liberal sector of the white ruling class or the African petty bourgeoisie. So that by 1964, when the first civil rights bill was passed, and then 1965 when the voting rights act was passed, it all should have been over effectively because the basic democratic rights that the movement was struggling for had been achieved. But it hadn't been achieved for the masses of African workers and poor people who were able to determine that yes, the preachers and the lawyers and the rest of it, you got what you want, but what we want and need is black power. We're not out here trying to struggle to change anybody's mind. What we want is power over our own lives. And when the movement determined that the issue was power, what it did was put itself in the same level as all the other revolutionary struggles of oppressed people happening everywhere in the world. It became an anti-colonial movement at the juncture the issue became one of power. When they said power, it united with the struggles being led by people like Che Guevara, and not only throughout Latin America, but in Africa, and all the oppressed and fighting peoples of the world. That became a crucial issue. The issue is not to make your oppressor like you and struggling against his racism. The issue is not running around trying to educate the oppressor uh, to stop doing something bad to you. The issue was to get the power over your life so that no matter what the oppressor thinks about you, he can't do nothing to hurt you. In fact, if you want to, you can do a job on him. Every nation on the African continent that has gotten its independence brought it about through the philosophy of nationalism. And it will take black nationalism that to bring about the freedom of 22 million Afro-Americans here in this country where we have suffered colonialism for the past 400 years. Malcolm X was the ideological leader of this movement. He became the ideological father, if you will, of this movement that we are dealing with even today. In fact, Malcolm had been killed by the imperialist precisely because of where he was trying to take the movement even before it matured to the place that it matured. In the United Nations, you have poor nations and rich nations. They say that the most powerful block in the UN are the African Asian, is the African Asian block. These are the poor nations, yet they carry more weight in, a, uh, in this political body 
than the nations do who have all the money. Why? Because no matter how wealthy America is, she only has one vote. No matter how wealthy Russia is, she only has one vote. You and I have to look at this and understand this, that the ballot is as powerful as the bullet. Malcolm was assassinated, but it was too late. By 1967, we saw the rise of the Black Panther Party, which took the struggle even further. An organization immediately and explicitly informed by Malcolm X, influenced by Malcolm X, who, who told us, Malcolm, who told us that every African, since it's legal to have a shotgun, every African should have a shotgun in his house. And he's also said that we should form rifle clubs. Didn't he say this? We should form rifle clubs all over this country. And Huey P. Newton heard Malcolm X and formed the Black Panther Party and was able to say that it was the influence of Malcolm X and, of course, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which also was influenced by Malcolm X, that, that, that gave rise to the Black Panther Party and what it stood for. Who killed Huey? Don't tell no lie. It's the government, the government, the FBI. At the high point of FBI involvement with the Klan, one out of four Klansmen was an FBI agent. So a lot, if not all, of, that, of, of Ku Klux Klan policy and actions were being directed by or uh, acquiesced in by the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover, who was then the executive director of the FBI, which is the, one of the political, secret political police in this country characterized the Black Panther Party as the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States since the Civil War. And that's a statement about the potential for the power, the power that we look for. And that's a statement about where the power should be looked for. It is in the masses of African workers and poor people who, given organization and ideological clarity, can achieve anything. People learn by example. I think I don't think anybody has an argument with that. I think that when Huey P. Newton said that people learn basically by observation and participation, I think that everybody caught on to that. So what we're saying very simply is that if they learn by observation and participation, that we need to do more acting than we need to do writing. And I think the Black Panther Party's doing that. That we didn't talk about a Breakfast with Children program, we've got one. We're not going to tell you how many kids we intend to feed and speed in Chicago. We're feeding 3,000 to 4,000 every week already, and I don't know how many all around the country. We know that it was the Black Revolution once unleashed which gave rise to virtually every other progressive entity that occurred. It was the Black Revolution even that took the white woman out the kitchen and white homosexuals out the closet. It was the Black Revolution that energized the movements of other oppressed peoples, the indigenous peoples in this country. It was a powerful and profound revolutionary movement that shook this country to its very foundation, that took, shook the system. And what we saw was a, a movement to cut and undermine the revolution, a movement that created assassinations, created what we refer to as a counterinsurgency. And this led to the FBI and its COINTELPRO program and its other racially oriented programs actually being implicated in and instigating uh, crimes, civil rights crimes, uh, murders and, and such things. The Birmingham church bombing, uh, the assassination of the civil rights workers, freedom riders. An account insurgency is a military term and it's a military term of warfare that uses every form. It uses psychological warfare. It uses actual armed struggle. It uses economic warfare. And the primary strategic aims of counterinsurgency is resource and population control. By the 1990s, the historic gap between whites and blacks in education, income, and access to skilled employment narrowed considerably. But with deindustrialization and urban decay affecting numerous families and most suburbs still being off limits to non-white people, the median wealth of white households remained 10 times greater than that of African Americans, and nearly a quarter of all black children lived in poverty. This was the birth of the Drug Enforcement Administration. This was also the origin of the heron epidemic that hit our communities as soon as the Panthers and other revolutionary organizations were taken off the street. 
This was a time when the United States government was involved in a counterinsurgency war against the heroic and courageous people of Vietnam. And so on the one hand, they were making war against the people of Vietnam, and they were making war against the African people here with another counterinsurgency in the form of Heron. Well, two things are happening. Number one, we're hearing about soldiers becoming addicts, but we're also beginning to get flooded with heroin coming back. There might have been soldiers bringing it back for their own use and maybe in small amounts to do business. But really, the heroin being smuggled famously back in body bags was being smuggled by the CIA. It was really to support the warlords of Thailand, who were our allies. It was to secure their favor. Many people would maintain that Air America, the CIA's operation in Southeast Asia, was responsible for a lot of the, the heroin that came in. The result was blowback. You know, more drugs on the streets of American cities. And the heroin was everywhere. There was not a city that was too small or too rural if African people were there for heroin not to be there. Then what we saw was in 1979, of course, the Sandinistas, the FSLN, rode into Managua and rode into power in Managua, overthrowing Somoza, the Somoza regime that had been put there, put in place by the U.S. government. And when the Sandinistas rode uh, into Managua, the United States government shifted from Southeast Asia into Latin America. And guess what? Just so happens in Latin America, most of the world's cocaine is harvested. In January 1981, Ronald Reagan became America's president. Reagan's foreign policy, the Reagan Doctrine, emphasized rolling back global communism by supporting rebel groups fighting communist governments, both openly and covertly. In 1982, without informing Congress, Reagan gave the CIA permission to aid the Contras with a $19 million budget. Unable to use American funds directly to support the Contras, a plan was hatched to do it indirectly. For months, the US had been surreptitiously selling weapons to Iran, which was at war with Iraq at the time. In exchange, Iran would help free American hostages in Lebanon. In December 1985, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, a military aide to the National Security Council, proposed a modification, whereby the arms would be sold directly to Iran and some proceeds diverted to the Contras. A subcommittee headed by John Kerry would later allege that North and the CIA had also helped build up a cocaine trafficking network to provide additional funding to the Contras. And guess what? All of a sudden, African people lost our taste for heroin and suddenly we got involved in cocaine. But it wasn't just cocaine. It wasn't cocaine. It was a derivative of cocaine. It was something that somebody went into a laboratory and created so that it would be cheap enough for massive distribution throughout the African community. So one of the greatest ironies about the drug war, just like with prohibition in the 20s, when you make something illegal and people have no other resources to lean upon to feed their families, you have created a very, very dangerous economy. Studies have demonstrated consistently that the rate of drug use among whites and people of color is essentially the same. But if you look, you see a huge disproportion with respect to people of color. And so it has been a very racially targeted campaign. So now there's a counterinsurgency war that's being initiated against the Nicaraguan people in the Nicaraguan Revolution and another war that's being initiated against the African people here in the form of crack cocaine chemical warfare. This is what we are talking about. The United States government did it. August 20 of 1996, a white guy out of San Jose, working for the San Jose Mercury News, kicked off a series of newspaper articles revealing the FBI involvement in creating crack cocaine epidemic in our country. What we understood was that the White House is the crack house and Uncle Sam is the pusher man. But when you talk about the CIA, you know what has to be understood is you're talking about the American government. I think the package we brought forward addresses a quote, drug problem. That's the American government that did it. That put crack cocaine in our communities that's resulted 
and I, we don't know how many people locked up, how many people dead, because J. Edgar Hoover had made the statement that what he wanted to be very clear was that to young, young Africans, that if you become a revolutionary, you'll be a dead revolutionary. And so it was designed to demoralize the community and create this sense of invincibility and white power that you can't fight them without dying. And people were, in many instances, terrified to sit up in a meeting like this with children and what have you and have the door kicked in and FBI and, and agents and other cops running in with their guns drawn. This was common stuff where the FBI would attack a building and would destroy the materials, where they take your newspapers and sit them in the middle of the room and set them on fire or piss on them or do some other kinds of things and make them un This was the terror that existed inside this country. And when they did this to the young, uh, to young African workers and poor people, then we saw all these other so-called Negro leaders who would come up attacking the community. The problem was the community. We need to atone. We need this and that. We should not allow people to be able to distribute this poison without fear. Congressman Rangel, along with much of the black political leadership, was a key advocate for erecting these laws in the first place. They should be caged like wild animals because that's what they are. We are not going to be put back into slavery by our own people. It wasn't that the government was the problem, it was the people who were the problem. One of the things you begin to understand is that America needs the narrative of black pathology. You know, everything would be fine if only black folks would. Right? We've heard this. And then you begin to fill in the blank. If only they would value education. If only they would not be thugs. If only they would. You fill in the blank in terms of that black pathology because that is absolutely necessary in the narrative of America. And so we had to struggle against this concept that was out there even among the African working class itself. Because uh, what we found is that the people who were out pushing crack cocaine often thought it was their idea that they were doing it. They thought, I'm out here doing this because this is my idea, but it wasn't their idea. This is the circumstances that we're living with today. This is the consequence of the success of counterinsurgency. Destroy our leaders, destroy our organization, disperse the members of the organization, and then turn reality upside down. This education system not only fails students of color through inadequate resources, it also creates a school to jail track. Looking at statistics on suspension rates from kindergarten through high school, black kids are suspended and expelled from school far more often than white kids. Expelled students have a higher chance of being arrested or ending up in juvenile detention centers, where they're introduced into the criminal justice system. While one in every 17 white males has the likelihood of being in prison, one in three black males is more likely to end up in prison. In fact, for black males in their 30s, one in ten is either in a prison or a jail on any given day. But if we look at these rates of incarceration, what we have, in fact, is a racial prison industrial complex. Prisons are a way to deprive supposed criminals of their freedom as a way to pay society for their crimes and violations of the social contract. They began as institutions of reform and re-education, but have turned into sites of political disenfranchisement, economic privation, and dissocialization. In this way, they perform a dual role. They're sites of dispossession and sites of capital extraction. They're political economic engines that transfer economic wealth and political capital from blacks to whites and thus the benefit from whiteness. They looked at that black population as revenue generators. So, you're doing 26 and a 25, boom, ticket. Hmm, I don't think you fully stopped at that stop sign. Boom, ticket. Ah, looks like you've got a broken tail light. Boom, ticket. And so when you start hitting this community with $50 tickets, $25 tickets, $80 tickets, $100 tickets, and you begin to think about what that means. You pay the ticket or you pay your rent. You pay the ticket or you keep food on the table. You keep the lights on. There's not disposable income here. When you don't pay that ticket, the next time you're doing 26 and a 25, because now there's a warrant out for your arrest then you are jailed. 
and then the entire criminal justice process of fines and court fees and bail are all pulling from this working class black community. And many of our own folk, as I said before, and particularly the black leaders, unite with the definition that they create for us. What we refer to as neo-colonialism. Some people refer to it as Negro colonialism. And neo-colonialism is white power in a black face. Under old colonialism, it was real clear who was running stuff because the white man stood on top of everything, controlled every aspect of our lives. Neo-colonialism comes about when the masses become too astute and to accept obvious foreign domination then it becomes necessary for them to use what they call indirect rule, neo-colonialism. Look at Philadelphia as an example. Under the boot of this terrorist thug Rizzo, a thug, you understand, who bragged that he had a police department that was so vicious that it could defeat the Cuban army. I'm talking about this thug. And uh, the masses of African people rising up, trying to get organized to get rid of this thug. This was the basis of a huge movement that existed in Philadelphia. Big old so-called Black United Front got created in Philadelphia around that. And who becomes the spokesperson, the helmsman for this movement? A Democratic Party hack who all the years she's been in the Democratic Party never stood up for African people, never stood up to Rizzo, never said feed, clothe, and house my people. All these African people got behind Wilson Good, and elected him as the mayor, didn't he? I mean, people worked, worked like hell to elect and, and did some, some fierce political work in this city. And in this city, they had a, a holdover, a remnant of the movement that didn't get quite wiped out, at least visibly, in dreadlocks and what have you, and everybody calling themselves Africa. And it was a real problem for the city of, of Philadelphia. And so when it became time to get rid of them permanently, it wasn't Rizzo. Rizzo tried it and the people pushed him back. It was Wilson Good who gave the order and bragged about it. And he had a bomb drop on them African people. And when he did it, it confused so many people. And people were in a state of denial because they went out and worked for this guy. They worked, worked, worked. They couldn't believe it. They made up excuses for him. You heard him say it. He didn't do it. No, don't tell me. He admitted to doing it. He bragged about it. And not only him, but a whole cabal of Negroes in that administration with him participated in it. What would have happened if Rizzo would have dropped that bomb? Not only would, they have, would Philadelphia have been on fire, but there wouldn't have been a city in this country with black people that wouldn't have been burning. But they could do it because of Wilson Good. Well, if they would have simply embraced these move members as valid and, and valued community members, they could have worked together in tangent and said, well, you know, since you embrace environmentalism and uh, an awareness of, um, you know, animal rights, and, and uh, black power, how about we establish a, a community garden whereby we can um, incorporate all those values, right? And so we see today in 2018, you know, where community gardens actually raise the values of, of property owners, right? And so th there's a, a range of and a host of values we could have easily incorporated as neighbors, as people engage in empathy and love and compassion that would have allowed MOVE members to coexist in this West Philly neighborhood. But that, of course, would not happen, unfortunately. Well, it can't be racism because y'all got a black police chief. Ain't that what they say? You can't be racism because the mayor is black. And we agree with him. Of course, one it's colonialism. It is domination by a foreign and alien power over another people. Imperialism, white power is the enemy, was the enemy when it first came to Africa, snatched up the first African, brought us here against our will, is the enemy today. In the history of the United States, these four institutions have been intricately entwined. 
seamlessly transitioning into each other. Over the last 400 years, these racist institutions have produced, reproduced, renewed, and made racism enduring in the U.S. Interestingly enough, the U.S. prison population skyrocketed after the Civil Rights Act, mostly caused by the U.S.'s war on drugs, which, according to former Nixon advisor, was created to target black communities and hippies. That is colonialism! And a colonial power will use anybody! Debbie Africa, the first of the nine to be released from prison at the time of her arrest. She was eight and a half months pregnant with her son, Mike Jr. He was born inside prison. After nearly 40 years behind bars, she was released and reunited with her son, Mike. The system is guilty. It is a system that dropped bombs on people. He said people ain't going to condemn the MOVE organization as being a bunch of kill crazy, bloodthirsty murders when it's the government spilling blood, killing life out of greed. This system not only here, but in this country, is such that this, it keeps on going on. And those things the system doesn't do, the fairness we don't feel, all of the, it's like the wheel that keeps rolling and if you want it to change, you've got to find a way. We're morally compelled to remember. I respect those who are behind me. I respect their views. I know they have hurt. Because you get in this racism question, you can't even explain why the hell good dropped the bomb. You can't explain why black people have been in white people's armies to kill other black people. I hate black keys on the piano. I hate my gums because they black. I hate Whoopi Goldberg's lips. I hate the back of Forrest Whitaker's neck. <laughs> The report identified black identity extremists as a threat to law enforcement. Domestic terror threat by the FBI. According to the FBI assessment, it was very likely that these terrorists would target law enforcement officers in retaliation for perceived police violence against African Americans. Due to the assessment classifying the group as a domestic terror organization, the FBI is able to justify any invasive surveillance tactics used in monitoring these targeted individuals. A person cannot be targeted for investigation based solely on First Amendment activity. So by creating this black identity extremism movement, they can use that as the justification to then target any activist who, or any black person who is protesting police violence. But it's colonialism. It is the political power that we have to fight for. We have to have the power. And damn it, let me tell you something. The issue is not whether white power, white people like you. The issue is whether you have the power so that whether they like you or not, they can't do nothing to hurt you. And guess what? When you got power, you find out a lot of people would like you who didn't like you before. If you really want somebody to like your ass, get your ass some power. We believe in natural law, the government of self. The fact that something is legal under the system's laws doesn't make it right. Slavery was legal. Killing Native Americans and stealing their land was all done legally. True law is self-explanatory and self-enforcing. You can go as far as you want in the forest and you won't find no jails. Because... The animals of the forest don't believe in jail. But come to civilization, that's all you see. You have the emergence in human society of this thing that's called the state. What is the state? The state is this organized bureaucracy. It is the police department. It is the army, the navy. It is the prison system, the courts, and what have you. This is the state. It is a repressive organization. But the state is here. Well, you know, you've got to have the police, because if there were no police, look at what you'd be doing to yourselves. You'd be killing each other if there were no police. But the reality is, the police become necessary in human society. Only at that juncture in human society, where it is split between those who have and those who ain't got. I throw a Molotov cocktail at the precinct. You know how.